What's going on, Hacker Valley fam? Welcome back to the show. Question for you. Can you protect what you can't see? Wait, don't even answer that because we already know that the answer is no. We've learned this the hard way by implementing practices like asset management and things are changing every single day. We have to inventory our SaaS apps. If you're not, the SEC is going to come at your neck potentially, especially if you're a publicly traded company. Um, but we're going to talk about how to cover your SaaS, especially how to avoid giving out risky OAuth grants. To talk about this subject, I brought in a great guest, friend and sponsor, Jaime Blasco. Jaime is the co-founder and CTO at Nudge Security. Jaime's been on the podcast before. He is essentially Hacker Valley fam and Nudge was gracious enough to sponsor this episode to give you all of the insights and details that you need to cover your SaaS. So without further ado, let's jump right into it. Who says tech can't be human? Yes. Good morning. Good to see you. We did an episode a few months back. We had so much fun. We had to do it again. Um, so let's jump in to it. But first, let's kind of go over your background. When I, when we first met, you were working at Alien Vault. You were deep down the, the rabbit hole of intelligence. Now, looking into the future, you're focused on a different type of intelligence. But I still look at um, the areas that Nudge helps at with as intelligence driven, internal intelligence, especially. So uh, if you can uh, speak a little bit about your background and what you're doing today at Nudge. Perfect. Yeah. So, you know, as, as you said, I, I been working my whole career on, on the threat intelligence space, right? I was chief scientist at Alien Vault. Uh, we got acquired by at and and then I had a, a, a few roles over there in terms of, uh, you know, uh, Managing the you know data science and and threat intel teams over AT and T cybersecurity, and you know after after twelve thirteen years working on, on that space, I I decided hey, there there are other problems that organizations are facing today, and you know one of them was SaaS, right? Like we we went from a world where everything was on prem. And there were obviously a lot of security issues because of that. And then we saw how organizations slowly started migrating to the cloud and then to a, a, a SaaS first, first world, right? Like we see modern organizations where, you know, if you have a startup today, chances are you don't have a data center, you don't have a rack. Everything is uh, SaaS applications out there. And one of the, the issues that we saw is, uh, you know, was that, you know, like modern you know, like ex existing security tooling was not ready for, for this world. And not only the tooling, but also how you approach this problem, right? It, you know, for for a decade, we have been doing security in terms of like, you can do this, you can do that. And um, one of the things we are seeing is like, you know, people don't operate like that anymore, right? Like uh, chances are if you don't allow people to use the software that they like uh, in your company, they're gonna go and, and and work for someone else. So that was the main main promise of why why we started the, the new company. Speaking of not having the tools that they like or that are most productive for them, they might go work for another company or they might try to secretly use that tool on their personal device or sign up for that that SaaS app. And you know that's kind of along the lines of what we're gonna be speaking to today is finding ourselves in risky situations because of interactions like this, where we're not necessarily enabling the team to, you know, onboard as quickly as they may want, but also nudging them to uh, do the right things. So when you look at the landscape of SaaS, when you look at even the topic that we're going to be speaking about more today, OAuth grants, what is the current state? Yeah, so we are, you know, as I mentioned, uh, we are seeing modern organizations that are like completely SaaS, right? Like we don't, we don't see a lot of, a lot of, uh, you know, on-prem software or on-prem appliances anymore. Uh, and then you have those larger enterprises that are in this mess, which is, you know, a mix of everything. 
And that causes a lot of issues in terms of, uh, you know, investment in security, right? Because then you have to cover everything from like on-prem facilities to like cloud. And it's it's a challenge, right? And and as I mentioned, not a lot of that uh, you know security tooling is ready is ready for this. Uh, one of the one of the things that happened, uh, and probably like two things that happened that accelerated this even more was like one COVID, right? Like when when COVID happened, all of a sudden you have all your employees at home. Uh, yep. They were trying to find new ways of doing getting things done, and that. Cause a lot of like new SaaS adoption, right? And, and we have a we have data about this where we saw we saw uh, after 2020 the rate of new SaaS apps like doubling pretty much for for most of organizations out there. And then the second one was uh, you know the transformation that uh, generative AI and like AI in general is having in organizations. We see so so much AI adoption, AI adoption, like you know uh, we're. Seeing larger enterprises where there are like more than a hundred unique uh, AI uh, SaaS tools that their employees are adopting, and IT and security teams are having a really hard time because most of this adoption is coming uh, uh, bottoms up, right? Like it, there is no procurement; it's really an employee wanting to yeah. get things done and adopting a new tool and inviting new, new, uh, you know, inviting other coworkers, and and that causes a lot of you know pain in terms of IT and security management. When you look at something like SaaS, there is something that happens in the background that I don't think we necessarily understand to a great degree as security practitioners, but especially when you look at the end user, and that's an OAuth grant. So give me a rundown as to what an OAuth grant is, how that exactly works, and how does that relate to security? Yeah, definitely. So as, as you mentioned, a lot of SaaS applications require, uh, you know, integrate with other uh, source of data or APIs, right? So let's see that you have a Google account. If your organization is a Google Workspace, uh, you know, shop, and then you want to, you know, make sure that your calendar is up to date with Slack, right? So what happens uh, in ter- from a technical perspective, what happens is like you have seen those screens that pop up that says Slack wants access to your, you know, uh, calendar, uh, or Slack wants access to your Google Drive, or a random app needs access to everything. Like uh, what we're seeing is like you know a lot of employees are not really trained uh, to understand what what's going on here. And one of the things we are doing is actually you know uh, from an awareness and training perspective. But you know basically that that's in a nutshell what an OAuth grant is, right? Is it's uh it's you know, a grant that allows uh, a service account on the provider side to access certain resources in, in, in one of your applications. And that can be, you know, Google, Microsoft, Slack, Zoom, uh, Sapier is one of the big offenders, yes. uh, you know, yeah. So I have one pulled up, an OAuth grant. It's from Google Calendar to your Slack workspace. And I think that when you see something like this, it's almost like the terms of service. Like I feel like we kind of like mindlessly just say, okay, yes, sure. Uh, yeah, you need to be able to perform actions as me because I'm connecting my calendar to Slack. So naturally, yeah, I want you to perform actions. But what is the implications of allowing Google Calendar to access another application? What kind of risk does that impose on us? And like, what have you seen from... Uh, maybe these two applications, Google Calendar and Slack. Yeah. So, you know, in, in terms of calendar, it's usually a lower risk, right? Because, you know, yeah, someone accessing your calendar, I mean, if, if it's, you know, high or wrong, it's not a big deal. But if it's, you know, a, a government official or, you know, the CEO of a public company, there's a lot that you can actually gather from those calendar, calendar invites. But, you know, there are many all of, uh, permissions and, and this is one of the challenges, right? Uh, there are like thousands of different permissions that these, uh, applications can, can ask for. And, you know, there are things like access to all your Google Drive files or access to your email or access to listing users or even, you know, modifying of, uh, you know, settings in your Google workspace or Office 365 environment. So there is a lot that goes into analyzing uh, more importantly, what what app is performing this, right? Because Google Calendar is is owned by Google. We all understand that Google is one of the you know 
more, more, you know, more secure organizations out there. But when the app that is asking you for permissions is like some random thing that you don't know about, uh, there is a lot of work that you need to do in order to understand, you know, who owns it, where the data is hosted, you know, how they're accessing the data, how they're protecting the secrets. Like, um, there's a lot of risk, uh, you know, uh, 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 you know, risk analysis that you need to do from an IT and security perspective to make sure that this is actually, you know, like, like two main scenarios, right? One, do you trust that vendor? Do you trust that they're going to do a good job protecting your, this access? And second, you know, is this actually a benign, you know, is, is this actually a malicious grant? And, and we have seen this throughout history, right? Like some of the large, largest, you know, hacks out there, you know, like the Democratic Party yeah. uh, happened because of a, a, a malicious auth grant, right? That was sent as part of a phishing, uh, a spear phishing campaign. So, yeah. So we have we have more examples, and you know I think you're right. Um, the Google Calendar example, I feel like it's still very important, especially if it's connected to Slack, because like you will have the ability to read all of my events. That could have like customer information in those um, um, in that in, the, in that in those headlines for calendar invites. It could also have their email addresses. So like I'm if at giving access to another application. I'm giving away a lot of my my information. I'm giving away a lot of my sensitive information uh, at that. And then when you look at something like Zapier, which I have pulled up here, um, this is going to need a lot of access. If you're going to use something like Zapier, it's going to be automating many tasks for you. I personally use it at Hacker Valley. It takes um, information from our website. And as people fill in a form, it puts it into our Slack channel. Then it puts it into a Google uh, Sheet. So just for Zapier, I've now granted three different applications access uh, to that application. Um, so when you look at an OAuth grant, would you say that it's more risky because of the data that can be stolen or because of the access of an attacker being able to um, swim around? It's both, uh, and you know, different organizations have different risk profiles. Uh, you know, some some organizations do care a lot about the type of data that you are actually uh, giving access to. Uh, you know, sometimes in Google Drive you don't have, you know, or OneDrive you don't have a lot of conf confidential data. But if you are giving access to your email, that's that's a separate thing, right? But then uh, some organizations do care a lot uh, around supply chain, who the vendor is, where the data is going to be hosted. Uh, you know, you have kind of like regular, regulatory issues as well. Like if you're a public company or if you're a, in a highly regulated environment, like you need to analyze all these things to make sure that you are also compliant with, with all, all your certifications. So it, that risk profile varies a lot in terms of, uh, you know who who you are and, and what data you are you are managing. Yep, absolutely. And, and, and you know, the other thing I would say, even even something that seems benign, uh, like you know Slack, right? Like oh, like most of this or a lot of the Slack apps uh, have the ability to read and send messages because that's that's the way it works. But think about all the data that you have in Slack nowadays, right? Like. Companies have like PII. Companies have like secrets. Uh, people make mistakes and paste passwords, or you know, there's source codes in there. So like, there's a lot of and and if you remember the the uh, EA hack a while ago, like that yep. happened through Slack, right? So basically, the the attacker was able to uh, uh, you know steal a browser cookie from one of the uh, uh, is, you know EA employees for Slack. And then they access, they use that access to through Slack, you know, find information and you know, <laughs> you know, ask IT for more access, which is crazy. But you know, sometimes something that looks benign, uh, you know, if you start thinking about it, how you will use that access uh, with your black hat, you know, hat. <laughs> yeah. But you you can come up with a lot of interesting use cases, and, and this is kind of like the the modern lateral movement, right? And and th this is something that not a lot of people have spent time thinking about, which is, yeah, we all understand how lateral movement uh, works in, you know, traditional networks, right? Like, you know, you you compromise ADE, uh, you can move laterally with, with those credentials. 
there is a lot of that that can be done in, in, in SaaS environments, right? Like you can go from any, you know, uh, email, you know, access to, you know, being able to take over accounts via password resets. You can, you know, one of the features we have in our product is like misconfigure Google Groups, mm-hmm. where, you know, people are creating Google Groups that are public for the organization. So anyone in the organization can join. Yes. But then it may be something like DevOps are your organization.com and they're creating SaaS applications using that email, which, which means that anyone can join the group, reset the password and access that application, right? So there is a lot of moving pieces uh, that you can use to move laterally uh, from, from a, an attacker perspective. And you know, this is an area that uh, we have seen a lot and we will probably want to publish some research uh, and some of these techniques that are, are pretty, pretty, you know, unique. I have to jump in for a second and tell you about our sponsor for this episode, Nudge Security. When I got with the Nudge team, they wanted me to ask you, our listener, a question. If your CEO came to you and asked, hey, are we using that SaaS app that was just breached? How quickly and confidently would you be able to answer? Sure, you can look at something like SSO, but does that really answer the question? Looking at how fast SaaS apps are adopted makes it a real challenge to really understand who's using what and to also understand the possible implications when a popular SaaS app is breached. Please allow me to introduce you to Nudge Security. Nudge discovers and categorizes every account for every SaaS and cloud app created by anyone in your organization. How do they do it? Their discovery method takes advantage of a simple yet consistent design pattern of every modern SaaS provider, account confirmations via email. Email is the perfect event log to understand which SaaS apps are being used and to also discover shadow IT. The best part, Nudge can provide you a full inventory of all of your SaaS and cloud accounts in just minutes. Not only would you know who's using what, but you can also automate communications to end users to notify and nudge them to take action on security incidents. But wait, there's more. Nudge Security will also notify you of breaches impacting your SaaS providers and breaches impacting the vendors used by your SaaS providers. It will help you mitigate supply chain and digital risks. Good news, you can see all of this for yourself by starting a 14-day trial by visiting nudgesecurity.com forward slash SaaS security. That's nudgesecurity.com forward slash SaaS security. Thank you, Nudge, for sponsoring this episode. I did want to circle in on the OAuth piece a little bit more uh, because it almost reminds me of Chrome extensions. Chrome extensions give us the ability to do a variety of things to be productive and to be collaborative. And I look at OAuth grants and really SaaS apps as a whole as a similar concept and paradigm for us. Uh, One of the challenges with Chrome extensions is sometimes they would get purchased. And that means now you're granting someone that you trusted, someone bought their company, and now it's someone new that you may not know or trust. Have you seen that happen with um, apps that uh, use OAuth grants? We, we have seen a lot of companies uh, getting acquired, right? And, and, you know, we haven't gone into the details of analyzing, like, you know, who the buyer is, if there are changes in terms of, uh, you know, jurisdiction or, like, where the data is hosted. But, you know, that's a, that's a great idea, something we should probably do some research in terms of if there has been some of those big ones. But, my my gut feeling looking at this data for a few years now is like there's probably a, a, a fair amount of those happening. Uh, you know, we have like, you know, tens of thousands of new SaaS applications coming out to market every year. Like a lot of those die pretty quickly. And, you know, you, you, you will imagine that, yes, uh, you can you can acquire uh, that IP and, you know, potentially use that access. Um, so, yeah. Like, I will say definitely it's something to be concerned about. Oh, hopefully I didn't give anyone any ideas on that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So let's talk about nudging uh, people to do the right thing. I love the what's behind the name nudge. It's almost kind of implied that you're not necessarily enforcing or telling someone what to do, but you're encouraging them to at least think about how to approach 
uh, security and manage their SaaS apps. Um, when I think about the fundamentals, like one of my favorite players in the game is right behind me, Kobe Bryant. Uh, when I think about Kobe Bryant, Kobe Bryant is a master of the fundamentals. He focuses on all parts of his game. But one of the most important parts of this game is the ability to shoot from any angle, shoot with his eyes closed from the free throw line, shoot from his eyes closed uh, from the three point line even. What would you say that is for SaaS? Like, what is the most fundamental piece? Um, I have some ideas, but I wanted to hear from you. I, I you know, absolutely, 100% for me, is it's visibility, right? What we are seeing is, like, people have no clue uh, what apps uh, their employees are using. And the people that tell you they know, they're usually lying because they only have visibility into a very small uh, percentage of apps that, you know, either uh, have been procured or, you know, they are expensive enough that they have visibility from a finance perspective or there are things like behind it and so on, things like that. And some of them may be able to do OAuth grants because that's a, that's low-hanging fruit, but there is much more than that, right? There, there are many other things that their employees are adopting, things from like free tools to trials to uh, apps that may cost uh, not enough that, you know, no one really <laughs> knows what's going on. So, you know, anytime we deploy in a new environment, like people are shocked by the amount of SaaS um, apps that are being used in the environment. Uh, we still haven't found anyone that said, oh yeah, you know, this number makes sense. It's usually yeah. like an order of magnitude less than, you know, more than what they were expecting. So let's talk a little bit about that secret sauce. We, from when we spoke uh, at an event here in Austin pretty recently, you were, we were talking about just the, the beauty of looking at an email inbox to get a determination of SaaS apps. I think that's, that's brilliant. I'm really glad that Nudge is doing that. Um, but what goes into that? Like, how does that work? You know, like, I'm sure that there's a lot of emails that could appear to be SaaS apps. How do you... Uh, get to the ones that are truly SaaS apps versus the ones that are um, maybe newsletters and whatnot. Yeah. So one, you know, let, let me start from the beginning. Like, so the way we discover these, um, it's it's like, you know, using different data sources, right? Like we go, like low hanging fruit is like all grants, right? Like we yep. can we can get that from an API. We can connect to your SSO, like Okta or, you know, Entra ID or whatever name has these days. Like, you, you never know if they change it again. Uh, uh, so that that's kind of like low hanging fruit. And, and some vendors do that. Uh, not really well, but they, they attempt to do that. Mm -hmm. But then the, 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 the unique way that we, uh, that we, you know, came up with, which actually we, we have a patent uh, uh, for that approach is, well, what happens with, Everything else, right? Like you can you can go to uh, you know Asana or you can go to Figma and create a username and password, and no one has visibility into what's going on there. So the the method that you mentioned, which is kind of like the the secret sauce that we have, which which blows people minds, right? Is that we built a, a machine learning classifier that basically is able to classify those emails. And more importantly, because we, you know, we, we do get this conversation a lot that is like, oh, you are getting access to our, our email. Well, we are very different from uh, other email security solutions that look at every single email that you receive. What we do is like targeted searches for machine generated emails, right? So we don't look at anything that is employee to employee communications or mm -hmm. uh, outbound communications. The only thing we look at is like known things like no reply at box.com or support at salesforce.com. So we really target only the machine generated emails. So there is no PII, there is no anything that you should be worried about in those in those emails. And then, you know, we, we, we fit that into a machine learning classifier that learn to understand uh, those patterns. Think about, you know, user invites, confirmation emails, password resets, uh, two-factor authentication enabled, disabled. There are so many signals we can actually get from those uh, that stream of emails that then we we cross correlate with other things to help us understand one as you know is an app being used uh, by whom uh, how often you know what type of actions uh, they are taking and then you know for for some apps we complement that visibility with other sources but you know that gives you so much in terms of like 
uh, apps that people are completely missing today. Like they were right. not aware of, of them. And, and so again, that, that visibility and discover, uh, I believe you can have, uh, a good SaaS security strategy if you don't have that visibility, right? Because yeah, we, we see the SSPM market where it's like, Oh, great. We're going to integrate with the top five SaaS apps that we use and we're going to see everything. Well, congratulations. What happens with the other 95% of apps that probably are going to get you in trouble because those are, you know, smaller vendors, uh, that have a, a, a larger risk. And, you know, from, from my point of view, both things are important. But again, you, you can have a, a good program if, if you don't know what, what's going on in your environment. Yeah, I would totally agree with that. That was going to be my suspicion and guess is inventory. Just knowing all of the apps that you have is step one. When you look at XSPM, uh, what I hear a lot is like, how do we implement the best practices for these SaaS apps? And I think that's step two is like looking at the configuration. But step one is truly just getting a lay of the land and having it be dynamic. Um, I think that's one of the other challenges is that I've seen is uh, security practitioners will go through an audit or a compliance um, uh, practice where they have to do their inventory, get a snapshot the very next day, maybe even an hour later, due to the fact of us adopting SaaS apps at such a fast rate, it might be obsolete that previous inventory that, that, they might, they, that they've collected. Yeah, and absolutely. This is this is a, a dynamic environment. It's not a one-time thing, right? And that's why it's so important to have a, a solution like this, where you know you can put it in autopilot, right? As new things show up in your environment, you can have workflows that communicate with your employees, collect more data, ask them to do certain things, or communicate with the security teams to make sure that cert certain controls are put in place, or things like legal reviews, security reviews are kicked off. Right. But again, if you don't have the visibility first, like there is, it's, it's super manual, right? And that's why we see all these people doing like a quarterly review or like yearly review, which in a face, in a face space environment, I don't think it's a, it's the right approach, right? Be, because if something shows up in your, shows up in your environment and you waited one year to even figure out that it exists and do a review, you know, think about in that year, like it a lot, Will have happened in terms of uh, you know um, issues with you know how the data is accessed uh, or you know the risk profile of, of that vendor, right? And don't even get me started. Like it's not even just your vendors, but it's that supply chain story, which you know I feel like that that's that's the new scary piece of all of this, which is you know we see in the news Okta has been breached. Uh, we've yeah. seen the news, you know, Sumo Logic the other day, like lost AWS keys. And it's like, even if you don't use those vendors, I bet that, you know, a good percentage of your SaaS providers are actually using those vendors. So now, you know, not only do you need that visibility into your SaaS applications, but you need visibility into when breaches happen. And, you know, even though you are not a customer, which of your SaaS vendors are using that technology because that can create risk that you need to address as, as soon as possible, especially for things like source code repos and, you know, things that you connect to GitHub or has some, some level of access to, to your environment. Yep. Uh, you were speaking about breaches. And one of the things that you mentioned is how would you know that someone that you gave an auth grant to or one of your SaaS vendors had a breach? Um, I know that that's one of the areas that you've been laser focused on is like bringing awareness to the security practices and also deficiencies of the vendors. So what what goes into some of that and what have been your findings so far? Yeah, so I, I'll think about that problem like twofold, right? One is kind of like traditional threat detection where, you know, you can you can use some of, you know, especially Google Workspace and Office 365 uh, APIs to keep, uh, you know, to analyze the access and, and how that's happening in your environment, right? It's something I, I want to, um, um, I, I think we have a, a, if you go to the next slide, I, I think we have an example. Um, there you go. So 
you know, and, and something I want to actually call out, uh, which, you know, hopefully we can pressure Google to do this. But, you know, one of the things we saw with, um, you know, you know, a few months ago with the DOJ, right, when the Department of Justice was uh, hacked uh, through Microsoft, mm -hmm. you know, Microsoft decided to make some of, you know, these APIs available for any type of customers, right? Before it was only available for customers that paid more, right? They were, you had to have a certain level of license. Google still does the same. Uh, this level of API, uh, you know, login, it's only available for enterprise customers. Uh, and, you know, well, uh, enterprise customers and, and um, you know, education customers or whatever they call them. Uh, but something I, I, I will ask if you're in the audience I and mean, you're a Google customer is like, please, we, we should pressure Google to do the same that Microsoft did because this can be, you know, a life-saving, you know, uh, source of data if you have to do forensics or threat detection uh, in, in terms of seeing how this access is utilized. Because, you know, what, what we are seeing here is like a specific OAuth grant, uh, right? Uh, what APIs is accessing, uh, you know, from where you can see the IP addresses. So this is critical from a forensic perspective, right? If, if one of these providers gets compromised, you can quickly go back and see if the access changed, right? Like uh, an example is like, you know, they are using an IP address in you know, Google Cloud or AWS. And all of a sudden, you know, you see that that uh, grant is being used from like Tor or from a, a VPN provider. That, those are very simple, you know, detection mm. uh, rules that you can create in, in your SIM or secure analytics tools to come out with, with these, uh, uh, you know, early, early signals. Obviously, if you know that uh, one of these providers have been breached, you probably want to do a more, you know, deep dive, uh, you know, analysis in terms of like trying to find changes on the APIs that they're, they're calling. Another example would be use some like basic anomaly detection in terms of like if this OAuth grant is only listing, you know, Gmail emails and tomorrow they're like downloading the emails. Maybe this is something you want to you wanna look at. And again, this is time consuming. Uh, only larger organizations have the resources to, to put this in place. But there are other things you can do, uh, or you can buy tools that actually help you with this as well, right? Um, and there are some, some out there uh, uh, that, that can help you with this. But, you know, more importantly is, you know, learning when those breaches happen, learning about those supply chain uh, uh, relationship, not just that, that vendor. And then, you know, making sure that you understand, you know, how that access is happening, uh, and what level of access they have, what data they're accessing, and do uh, some threat hunting uh, proactively to find, uh, you know, new behavior that could indicate that, that they, they are being breached. Because the other thing is, like, they may be breached and no one knows about it. Right? Yeah. So, like, you also want to do both uh, uh, proactively, but also when you do learn about, a, a you know, when you do learn about a breach, either from the vendor or from a third party, you want to spend some time making sure that you understand if that access has been used uh, to access you know, your environment in some, some form or the other. One of the things that I really like about what's shown here is the scopes. When I give OAuth grants, they define what scopes that they want to give their application. Like I, I see that it's going to have access to read my username, my email, my messages. I'm like, okay, that's interesting. And then my calendar, all in one OAuth grant. And what I like about this is maybe I don't want this application or I don't want my users in my environment using a specific scope of the application. I don't want them to be interacting with their email uh, messages when it comes to this, but like maybe there's artifacts around their email, like um, their signature block or something like that, that I do want to give the access to. With something like this, I could put some type of filtering and see like, hey, has this app ever used this scope? It says that it doesn't really need it, but has it used it? And if it's using it a lot, maybe that can give you some insight that this app is doing some funny business that you're not comfortable with, or someone has uh, maliciously gain control or breach this uh, this provider.
Yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, there are other things you can do, right? Like you can go from like blocking every OAuth grant, which again, we believe is not you know, the, the, the best <laughs> approach, but hey, we have seen organizations doing that to, you know, both Google and Office support the, the you know, approval workflow where someone, when they create an OAuth grant, it has to be approved by an admin. So the admin has time to verify, you know, uh, that that grant is 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 within the risk profile uh, and the risk, you know, uh, you know the, the risk that they're willing to take and in terms mm-hmm. of the, you know, as we said, the app, the level of access, you know, uh, whether you have a relationship with that vendor, and then you know the third one is like, well, you let people create new art grants, and then you have a really good way of like getting visibility to that and working with them, um, you know, to understand how it's being used. And then proactively from time to time, like trying to reduce risk in your environment, right? And, and that's one of the things that, that we also offer, which is being able to, you know, list off all those OAuth grants. We give you a risk profile. You can uh, manually revoke those grants if you want. But more importantly, you can nudge those users, ask them, like, are you still using Zapier? Now, mm-hmm. you know, Zapier still has access to every single Google Drive, Drive file. And we see you haven't used, you know, that access having, have, I haven't been used in one month. And then if they say, no, I'm not using it, it, it will automatically revoke that access for you. One other point I want to make in terms of uh, these access is, uh, you know, something that we see in, in every organization. And it's one of the also main drivers why people, you know, come to us, which is, you know, people realize that the offboarding workflows we have nowadays are, are broken, right? Like we see organizations uh, that, that when an, when an employee leaves, the only thing they're doing is really taking care of those uh, managed accounts, right? So like things that IT created, but what happens with everything else that, you know, one, you were not aware of, or the employee created by by herself or himself, or those old grants that do have access uh, is still to like different, uh, you know, different things in your environment, even if users has, are suspended, et cetera. But then the other piece is like, well, many people don't understand if something is going to break, right? Because an example is like, you know, the developer that set up the GitHub integration to do XYZ in the CICD pipeline through an OAuth grant leaves the organization. Do you, f- one, do you think you have enough visibility to know that that grant exists? And second, do you know what happens if that grant disappears like right. do you have confidence of you you're not gonna break anything in the in your environment so like having visibility awareness and interacting with those employees to understand how things are being used it's as critical as having that um you know uh, as having the ability to block or the ability to uh you know revoke that access because you know without context many times it's really hard to make uh, um you know make a call in terms of like whether something needs to exist or not, right? One of the things I've been surprised about when it comes to the SaaS security space is the fact that tech companies aren't doing more SaaS inventory because like from what I've seen from um, cybersecurity companies, especially looking at Nudge, is you have the security aspect, the inventory aspect that is kind of like an IT use case as well. But there's also the cost savings aspect. I think that is like one of those golden goose uh, pieces that's within um, SaaS inventory that leads to a lot of goodies. Uh, does Nudge also help uh, organizations like reduce SaaS spend? Like one of the things that just happened to us, we bought a duplicate app. We had an app that did one thing. They just came out with a new feature for it. And we just bought an app that only does that feature. I wish I would have known that there was um, some overlap there what, what have you been seeing that with capabilities of your product absolutely and you know this is something that our customers have have been asking for for pretty much since the beginning right which is you already have the data why don't you help me with this use case as well yeah. i think the the big change happened you know q1 q2 this year where you know uh the micro you know the micro environment started to look you know a, a little bit painful and we saw a lot of our, you know, prospects having to go through the the CFO to get approval for everything. And you know, one of the things that really helped is, you know, 
like what you mentioned is, you know, we already have the data. We have use cases where, you know, we call, we call cost optimization when you can do, you can do audits of existing apps and see if those licenses are being used or not. Uh, same thing with like people living and those licenses still being there on a sign. So like we, we do have those use cases as well, uh, to help you with, you know, optimizing those costs that, you know, are super important in this environment where, you know, people still, you know, really care about that. It's not longer like, you know, 20, 2020 where, you know, people were spending like crazy and they didn't care. Like, you know, uh, times have changed a little bit and we are seeing this use case. Uh, becoming more and more important. I think the other thing is, and and this is kind of like a large conversation, which which we think, you know, there are so many security tools out there, right? Yeah. Like like you know, and and that's why we are seeing and we are going to continue to see like, uh, you know, less from a fragmentation and more like players becoming larger and offering more features. We believe the the SaaS security, um, you know, the, the SaaS, SaaS security, uh, it's, it's, it's going to go through the same, right? Why would you need 20 tools to tell you different things about your SaaS applications? Like you probably need a platform that can help you with IT, with security, with finance, with, uh, you know, education, with, with a lot of different things. And, and I, the advantage of that is like, I mean, we have seen this over and over again, like security tools, in isolation are not as helpful as security tools where, you know, you can work with the other teams, you have all the context and, you know, the whole company is working together uh, to solve, you know, that problem. Uh, you know, because over and over in my career, I have seen, you know, SOC analysts and, you know, security architects that don't have the needed visibility to understand things in the environment. They don't know how the company operates. They don't know who owns the applications. They, you know, which teams like there's like a, a lot of context that you need uh, to 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 do a really good job in 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 terms of you know IT and security tasks. We're just about out of time, but I did want to give you uh, a moment, Jaime, to um, talk to our audience directly. Right, our audience work in cybersecurity. Everyone that's watching the stream or that watches the replay work in cybersecurity, if they were interested in getting started with Nudge, uh, what would be your recommendation uh, to get started with you? Yeah, definitely. There is a, you know, you can go to our website. There is a free trial. It takes a couple of minutes. You know, the integration is a Google Workspace uh, Marketplace app uh, or, you know, in the Office 365 side of things, it's a, you know, Azure AD enter Enterprise app. Uh, obviously, we're, you know, SOC 2 type 2 compliance. You can reach out. We will, you know, share the, the report with you. Uh, we can answer security questionnaires, whatever whatever you want to feel comfortable that, you know, we're, uh, we know what we're doing. Uh, just so you know, I mean, we pay, you know, we invest a lot in, in security and we architected this in a very secure uh, environment and we have, we all have security backgrounds and, and we are pretty paranoid, uh, but happy to answer any questions you have, uh, uh, around that. And yeah, I mean, you know, you can, you can also start the trial and do it with only your account instead of like with your organization and get a feeling, you know, you won't get access to all the features, but you, you can get a pretty quick feeling in terms of like, you know, the data and the use cases as well. So I invite you to, you know, visit at security.com and start a trial and hopefully you win that Steam Deck that, you know, my, mine is over here uh, collecting dust because uh, I, I don't have time to play, but, you know, <laughs> it, uh, it's a great, uh, you know, game, gaming device, especially if you travel a lot, you know, it's great for playing rights because, you know, you can just play any PC game uh, while, while you're on, on the air. So it does not get much better. Secure your SaaS app. Also get the Steam Deck, combine those two together, having an awesome, you know, amazing time at work because you got Nudge and you got your Steam Deck. Uh, but in all seriousness, though, Jaime, I wanted to say thank you to you personally. Also, big thank you to the Nudge team. Be sure to check them out. That is the best way to support Hacker Valley and the podcast is by checking out great sponsors like Nudge. Wanted to also remind the audience that I speak 
with each of the founders that sponsor the podcast and our content. So you have my blessing that Nudge is someone that you should definitely get to know, including Jaime. Be sure to to follow um, and uh, keep in touch with Jaime. And with that, we will see everyone next time.